This is the Demystifying Mental Toughness Podcast, hosted by David Charlton, and you're listening to this podcast to help you build your own mental toughness, or so that you can support other people or your clients better. Either way, you will learn more about developing this plastic personality trait that all but guarantees that you will perform better and lead a more prosperous life. Hi everyone, I hope you're well and having a good week. In today's episode of Demystifying Mental Toughness, I dip back into the archives and we take a bite from episode 13, where leading performance coach Carl Morris and I chat about emotional control, an essential ingredient of mental toughness. Carl goes on to share a very simple and effective strategy for those people who find it difficult to let go of mistakes and stay calm and level headed. We chat about a strategy for golfers, however, If you do get creative, this concept can be applied to any sport or setting. Enjoy. One of the things that I found really useful as a as a sort of thing that some everybody listening could start to work on straight away is play play a round of golf. And this 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 sounds a paradox, really. Don't try and change anything, but just play a round of golf and merely observe your reactions. Just go out there and you can kind of imagine that you've got a camera following you around and the camera's actually just going to watch the way you, you, you react to all the shots and that camera is taking some footage that's going to be displayed to people other than yourself. And, uh, you know, without getting too too deep into the, the woods on this, you know, the the idea that when you observe something, the, the, very, the very act of observing it potentially creates the mechanics for change. So um, it, it's, a, it's a really interesting one to do because years ago what I used to do is, is, is go out on the golf course and I'd film people playing, playing golf and I'd film the reactions and then I'd show them on a screen afterwards, this is, this, you know, this is what you were behaving like on the golf course. And they'd look at it and stroke the chin and say, oh, yeah, I'm not normally like that, you know, because it's, it's, it's kind of like the, 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 the reactions that we have on the course become so embedded and so natural and normal that they become habitual patterns so that we don't even know that we're doing it, you know. And, and, and if you said to me, well, why do, why do angry people get angry? My, my response would be that they get angry because they get angry. They get good at getting angry. They, 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 they are triggered to respond to in a certain way to what a golf ball does, and you just get very good at the anger response. But the, the, that, that first port of call, and as I say, it sounds a, it sounds a bit of a, of a paradox or a strange one, but just – just promise yourself that you're going to go out and you're going to note for 18 holes your your reactions. How do you react to the chaos that the game throws at? You know, I, I'll even have players play play 18 holes and say, well, what what as a as a follow on from this, what you could do is play 18 holes, and if you feel like you've reacted to the shots on that hole in a beneficial way, give yourself a tick, and if you, on the other hand, if you feel like you've reacted like a child. To, to what's happened out there in a way that's caused the spiral, you've got to put a cross on the scorecard. So you basically got a chance for 18 ticks only interrupted by crosses. Now, the good thing about that is that you engage people competitive competitive side then, and they don't want to see a card littered with crosses because, you know, basically you've then proven to yourself, excuse the language, you know, you behave like a dick for 18 holes because you, you, your reactions have been so so poor. So there's kind of lots of subtle ways I've found over the last few years of, you know, this, this idea of emotional control and, and we can get, you can get very deep into the sort of science of it all and it all gets very complicated. Or you could use some simple ideas that are very practical in nature that, A, are interesting to explore and then, you know, go out and play around the golf. And if you can get 18 ticks on your scorecard where you've reacted pretty well to anything that's come along, well, if you come off that round of golf, the very least that you know is that you've given yourself the best chance. You know, you've done the best you can that day. You've not you've not let poor reactions cause you to drop more and more shots. Because even at the even at high handicap level, that's generally the case. You know, we'll we'll play a hole badly and then we we'll play another one badly and another one badly. And you know, pe- people are not generally off eighteen handicap because they go and make eighteen but eighteen bogeys. They're generally off 18 handicap because they have a lot of pars, maybe some birdies, but they'll throw eights and nines in there, which, again, that, that's got some relevance to the swing. But a lot of it can be because you reacted badly to what happened on the previous hole. 
Yeah, I love that notion that when you're talking about observing and then the mental scorecard as well, the yeah, the ticks and the and the crosses. Because ultimately it's just helping people take a step back, isn't it? And recognize that maybe, oh, right on the eighth, or oh, I did yeah. this. And actually, this back nine, I'm not going to do that. And they can then adjust and make relevant changes going forward. What is a simple thing, David, the ticks and the crosses? You know, as I say, hey, it's fun to do it. It's, it's educational for yourself, but also it's a great mental tool because, you know, without even telling yourself, you're not going to want to see six crosses on the trot. You're not going to want to see six holes where you've reacted awful to whatever's happened. You know, it, it's, I think that's the problem in many ways with the, with the mental game and coaching the mental game. Unless you put some ways of kind of observing it or you put some ways of, of some kind of statistics on it, it's very difficult to measure. But, you know, my experience is when people, when people do this, you know, the, 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 they, they can see there's, a, there's often a correlation between, you know, poor reactions and poor scores. And then on the upside that they start to see, you know, if, if everybody listening played 10 rounds and played this game, do some analysis afterwards. Is there a correlation between your reactions and the scores that you do on a given day? And if you can get close to 18 ticks, and your score hasn't improved, well, okay, we've eliminated a variable. We know it's not that. It might well be swing. But but just for a period of time, you know, do something a little bit different. Look for the culprit in some different areas other than just whether you've, you know, you've come across it a little bit from the top of the backswing. I think the fact that you, you're sitting there for a period of time, a lot, a lot of people can get caught up in, well, I'll try that for one round. I, yeah, I don't like doing that, and they'll ditch it. But if you do it over, whether it's four, five, six, ten rounds, then you start building up those better habits, don't you? Yeah, and, and in effect, what you're doing is you're creating change without trying to change. You're just making a game of it, you know, and, and we, as human beings, we love games. That's why, you know, I know we're not going to perhaps talk about practice today, but I, I think for for most players, if there's an element of games in practice that give you statistics of where you, you game, where you you, you yeah, the quality of your golf is, is 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 a great thing to do. So, but yeah, to, to to get more objective about it and actually have something tangible, then it's not quite so sort of airy fairy and, and and left fielded as a you know there's a real practical element to it. That as I say, I've had players that just start to get to a point where there's just immense pride that you've played a round of golf and that you know you've given yourself the best chance that day. You might not have had a great overall score, but you've given yourself the best chance. Now, the interesting thing, I mean, I've seen it at the highest level, you get you get players who get better at this, and they might play a few tournaments where, you know, they're, they're, kind, of, they're kind of making cuts and doing okay, but nothing, you know, they're not, they're not ripping any trees up. But then all of a sudden, they, they actually as a result of reacting better to, to shots, they provide a platform to release the more of their A or B game. And all of a sudden, you know, if you're swinging it half decent and then you're reacting pretty well, well, then it gets interesting. You know, then you get a lot closer to your true capability then. When you look at some sports, emotional control and the ability to let go of mistakes is essential to be able to perform at your best on a consistent basis. And I'm wondering if you could get a handle on your mind and your body, what would it mean to you in your sport? What impact would improving your emotional control by 5% mean? Perhaps in those critical pressurized periods, you would stay more in control of your nerves. Or instead of getting excited when things are going really well, you'd remain calmer and not speed up or down and not speed up or slow down. And if we're honest, it doesn't matter what sport you play, Mistakes and errors are part of the game. Nobody's perfect. We can all get upset, frustrated, or angry at ourselves, and that's our right. The best players do. However, what separates them? The top, top golfers and athletes, they then have the ability to move on so, so quickly and let go of mistakes. And let go of mistakes. I call it a 30 second rule. They're very good at flicking a switch. They're very good at flicking a switch in a 30-second window or less in some sports. They don't then get too frustrated, replaying the shot or the incident in their heads time and time again, essentially spending time in the past. They don't judge themselves or the situation in the moment. They leave that till after the round or the competitive event. So if you do wish to improve this aspect of your mental game, go on. I really challenge you to take on board Carl's advice. 
and simply observe yourself. And if you want to use the mental scorecard, have a little look in the show notes. There's an example there with some more guidance. And also you might want to feel free to check out my tips and posts on Instagram under at mental toughness matters for more on this topic and many other topics as well. Enjoy your week ahead. If you enjoyed this episode of the Demystifying Mental Toughness podcast with David Charlton, do check out my website, sport-excellence.co.uk and my online sports psychology resources. Sport-excellence website has essential resources for anyone looking to build their own mental toughness or the mental toughness of their athletes or teams, or if you want to achieve peak performance more often or optimal functioning. Sport Excellence website has everything you need to keep moving forward and thrive. So go on, head over to sport-excellence.co.uk to find out more.